Hey everybody, welcome back. Miss Calabrese here with your second video on the endocrine system. Um, so last time we talked about the basics of how the endocrine system works uh, and also hormones that were associated with the hypothalamus and pituitary glands. Uh, in this video, we're going to be moving on to the rest of the major glands of the endocrine system and their associated hormones. All right, so starting up in the brain, um, so yeah, last time we talked about uh, hypothalamus and we talked about pituitary. Um, now we're going to bring in the, the pineal gland here. So the pineal gland um, is this small gland that sits at the posterior um, end of the diencephalon of the brain. Um, the main job of the pineal gland is to secrete melatonin. Uh, so melatonin is going to be important for controlling your circadian rhythm. So um, your biological clock that, that makes you sleepy at nighttime and makes you kind of more alert in the daytime uh, is, is a lot controlled by how much melatonin is released by that pineal gland. Uh, and it basically works by uh, responding to light, uh, surprisingly enough. So um, if, if, this, uh, if this brain here were, were in a living person, um, then we would see uh, their eyeballs right around here. Um, it's a really large eyeball for the size of that brain. But um, so the, the optic nerve then exits that eyeball, um, goes back into the brain here, crosses over and goes back to um, the occipital lobe here. But the amount of light, the amount of UV light that's actually entering into the brain um, will be noted by the pineal gland. And when light starts to, uh, the amount of light starts to reduce towards the end of the day, so the sun's going down, uh, there's less light outside, uh, that pineal gland starts to produce more melatonin uh, in response to, to lower light conditions. So it, it basically knows that it's nighttime and it's time to start uh, getting sleepy. Uh, and then when the sun comes back up in the morning, uh, we're not secreting that melatonin anymore and it's easier to wake up. Uh, this is one of the reasons why they say, um, you know, not to look at uh, uh, screens at, at nighttime, your telephone, your, your TV, because um, they emit the blue light that's very similar to the light that comes from the sun, and it tricks your pineal gland into thinking it's daylight, into thinking it's daytime outside and it's not time to go to sleep. So so I say limit that, that kind of uh, light exposure at night so that your pineal gland can operate as it's supposed to. All right, moving down to the thyroid gland. Uh, so the thyroid gland is located in your neck. Um, it actually is kind of in the shape of a, a butterfly almost, like two wings on either side of your neck. Um, so those, those two wings we would refer to as lateral lobes. Uh, they connect to each other in the middle uh, via an isthmus. Um, and inside those lobes, um, we have structural units called follicles. Uh, and those follicles are um, where we're actually creating the thyroid hormones. All right, so two major thyroid hormones um, that, that have to do with your metabolic rate are tetraiodothyronine and triiodothyronine. Um, sometimes we just refer to these as T4 and T3. Uh, tetraiodothyronine is also sometimes called thyroxine. So, so all of those names refer to your, your thyroid hormones that help control your metabolic rate. Um, and then another hormone that's also produced by your thyroid gland is calcitonin. Now, calcitonin doesn't have anything to do with metabolic rate. Um, this, this particular hormone controls the amount of calcium in your blood um, by lowering it. So if you have high blood calcium levels, calcitonin will uh, be released from the thyroid gland, and that'll tell your osteoblasts uh, to start depositing more of that calcium into bony tissue versus letting it uh, just roam around in the bloodstream. All right, so there's your thyroid gland. You can see it's positioned right in the neck, uh, just below your thyroid cartilage, which is also known as your Adam's apple. Um, so you can see the, the thyroid gland just kind of um, spanning over the trachea there, again, producing those two major metabolic rate hormones, T3 and T4. Uh, basically, the way that they control metabolic rate is by triggering your mitochondria. So remember, the mitochondria and all of your cells are there um, to, uh, uh, to break down uh, glucose and turn that glucose into energy, into ATP. So the more quickly they do that, the faster your metabolic rate is. If they're operating slowly and they're not generating a lot of energy from your food very quickly, then your metabolic rate is a little bit slower. So that's how these two hormones directly relate to um, 
to nutrient breakdown and energy synthesis. All right, so another picture of the thyroid gland here. So, so here we can see um, the thyroid gland um, as it's positioned around the trachea. These over, this over here is a um, microscopic picture of the thyroid gland. So we can see how the um, uh, histologically this tissue uh, is divided into follicles. So we've got these kind of um, these these follicles, which I'll sort of outline one here, so you can see where we've got um, the the colloid solution in the middle, so which I'll kind of draw a triangle in that region. So this is colloid solution in the middle, and that's where we're storing thyroid hormone. These uh, these cells around the outside, these are the ones that are actually producing the thyroid hormone. So again, you might be able to see that a little bit more easily in this um, drawing of it here versus the actual micrograph. Um, but we've got uh, follicles that are composed of the actual um, the epithelial cells that create uh, the thyroid hormone and then the, the, um, the colloid solution in the middle that's storing that hormone. All right, so a feedback loop here on how your, uh, your metabolic rate hormones operate. All right, so if we have low amounts of T3 and T4 in the blood, um, so we're not having enough of that thyroid hormone in the blood, um, then the hypothalamus is going to release thyrotropin releasing hormone. That thyrotropin releasing hormone is going to trigger the anterior pituitary to release thyroid stimulating hormone. Uh, once the anterior pituitary releases that thyroid stimulating hormone, um, it's gonna go trigger the thyroid to start uh, producing more T3 and T4, all right? So those cells produce more T3 and T4. T3 and T4 go into the bloodstream, find their way to all of the uh, mitochondria and all of your cells. It's gonna increase uh, the rate at which they convert glucose into ATP. Um, and as, they, um, as that rate increases, um, it's going to switch off our, our negative feedback loop here, right? So at this point now, We've got a high amount of T3 and T4 in the blood. Um, so that's going to um, tell our hypothalamus that now we've got too much of this in the blood and we can slow down. So it's time to slow down and produce less um, TRH, thyrotropin releasing hormone, which will eventually produce less TSH. And if we're producing less TSH, then it will eventually produce less T3 and T4. So it operates as a negative feedback loop. All right, um, possible things that can go wrong uh, with, uh, with your thyroid gland. Um, so one of the more common things that can happen with the thyroid gland is a goiter. Um, so goiter is when the, the thyroid gland um, is enlarged. Um, and this can be associated with conditions like hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism. But a lot of times um, it's, we see it commonly in third world countries where there is not enough iodine uh, in the diet. Um, so, so just to refresh, those T3 and T4, the actual names of those hormones are, are triiodothyronine and tetraiodothyronine. That means there's a lot of iodine uh, in both of those hormones, so you need a lot of iodine to manufacture them. Um, if you don't have enough iodine uh, in your body in order to manufacture those hormones, the feedback loop doesn't shut off the way it normally should. So, um, so you're your hypothalamus will recognize that you don't have enough T3 and T4 in your bloodstream, and it'll keep on producing TRH. Um, and then your, um, your anterior pituitary will continue to produce TSH as a response. Um, and that TSH is just going to continue to stimulate the thyroid gland to grow, to try to get it pr to produce more uh, T3 and T4. But if the iodine isn't there, um, then we end up with just this enlarged thyroid and without having the benefit of those excess T3 and T4 hormones being produced. Right? So that's what a goiter is and why it's usually associated with low iodine. This is also the reason why um, when you go to the store and you buy salt, it's iodized salt. It's because they artificially add the iodine in there to prevent this kind of thing from happening. All right, uh, another condition associated with, uh, with thyroid is sometimes hyperthyroidism. Um, so hyperthyroidism means that we've got too much of those metabolic rate hormones. Um, so we've got excess activity by the thyroid um, and it could be because of action of the pituitary gland secreting too much TSH. Uh, it could be that the thyroid itself is producing too much um, 
uh, T3 and T4. Usually um, symptoms of hyperthyroidism are anything that you would associate with increased metabolic rate. So um, your body heat is too high. Uh, your digestion is moving too rapidly, resulting in diarrhea. You're, um, you're breaking down your food more quickly, so you get weight loss, tremors, your heart's going faster. Um, so all of those are commonly associated with hyperthyroidism. Um, Graves' disease is a specific type of hypothyroidism um, that is caused by an autoimmune uh, problem. So the, basically your, your body is creating antibodies that, that tend to resemble thyroid stimulating hormone. Um, and because those antibodies resemble thyroid stimulating hormone, the thyroid just keeps producing um, uh, too much of its T3 and T4 and you get all of the, the common hallmarks of hyperthyroidism in addition to this um, uh, these kind of bulging eyeballs, which is called exophthalmos. All right, on the other side of the spectrum is hypothyroidism. So hypothyroidism is when um, we're not producing enough of those T3 and T4. So we have a lower metabolic rate, which means we're not converting food to energy as quickly. So we get weight gain. A lot of times you have a hard time maintaining body temperature. So you feel cold all the time, reduced libido, fatigue, um, uh, menstrual irregularities, and then uh, even some reduced mental um, acuity because of the, the fatigue usually. All right, so, so I mentioned this one um, before. So this is calcitonin, which is not uh, a thyroid hormone associated with metabolic rate, but only associated with uh, blood calcium levels. Um, so this calcitonin gets released when your body senses high blood calcium levels. So if the level of calcium in your blood is too high, your, your thyroid uh, gland will re re um, release calcitonin. Um, the calcitonin will then circulate in the bloodstream until it finds uh, its target cells. Target cells are gonna be osteoblasts. It's gonna tell those osteoblasts to, um, to grab onto all that extra calcium that's in the blood uh, and then um, use that extra calcium to create more bone. Right, so to deposit that extra calcium into bony tissue. Um, it also is going to inhibit the activity of osteoclasts so that they stop resorbing bone. Uh, and it's gonna um, increase the amount of calcium that is allowed to pass out into the urine. All right, um, on the posterior aspect of your thyroid, you have um, a few tiny little glands called parathyroid glands. So usually four or five of them on the back of the, of the thyroid gland. Um, and their job is to produce just this one hormone, parathyroid hormone. So parathyroid horm hormone basically does the opposite of calcitonin. So parathyroid hormone is used to increase blood calcium levels. If, if your body perceives uh, calcium levels in the blood to be too low, um, parathyroid glands will release PTH. That PTH will trigger osteoclasts to dissolve bone. Uh, to resorb that bone, that calcium, into the bloodstream, um, and so we can increase the blood calcium levels that way. It also helps your body absorb more calcium from the food that you're eating. So parathyroid hormone um, is an antagonistic hormone to calcitonin. So they, they have opposite effects. Parathyroid hormone increases blood calcium levels, while calcitonin reduces blood calcium levels. All right, and then here we can kind of see those, those parathyroid glands. So here you're looking at the back um, of the trachea. So here, here's your um, trachea here. Um, so we can see the back of the thyroid gland kind of poking out either side of it. Uh, and on the back of the thyroid gland, we have these, these four or five little tiny parathyroid glands that are just sticking around on the back there. All right, so moving on down, uh, next, uh, next endocrine gland that we find is the thymus gland. So the thymus gland um, we find sitting usually right on top of the heart. Um, the thymus gland we a lot of times associate with your immune system because the, the hormones that it produces are called thymosins. Uh, those thymosins stimulate the development of your T cells. So your T lymphocytes that are um, developing in the thymus gland are encouraged, their development is encouraged by these thymosins. That's the primary job of your thymus gland. 
All right, so moving down to the adrenals. So adrenal glands are located just above your kidneys, so they're kind of like sitting on top of your kidneys on either side. Um, they are composed of a few different um, uh, layers here. So the outermost layer of your adrenal glands is the adrenal cortex. Uh, and we can divide that adrenal cortex into its own three different zones. And those zones are gonna be based on what type of hormones they produce. Uh, and then the inside portion of the adrenal gland is the adrenal medulla. So this is the inner, innermost portion. All right, so here's a, here's a picture of your adrenal gland. So, so down here would be the, the kidney. So here you're looking at the, the kidney down here and then sitting on top of that kidney like a little kidney hat is um, your adrenal gland. So a little triangle shaped kidney hat up here. And that uh, adrenal gland is gonna be divided into both cortex and medulla. Again, the medulla is the innermost portion. The cortex is the kind of outer uh, portion around the outside of the adrenal gland. All right, so here um, we can see the, uh, the three different layers of the adrenal gland. So the, the, out, or the three different layers of the adrenal cortex, I should say. So the outermost layer of the adrenal cortex is the zona glomerulosa. Uh, zona glomerulosa um, predominantly produces mineralocorticoids, which are like aldosterone, which helps regulate your uh, mineral balance, so helps you regulate um, uh, uh, electrolytes in your body. Uh, the next layer of adrenal cortex is the zona fasciculata. Uh, zona fasciculata uh, or produces glucocorticoids. So glucocorticoids are hormones that let you regulate your glucose metabolism, so uh, things like cortisol. Uh, and then the bottom layer of the adrenal cortex is the zona reticularis. Zona reticularis uh, creates androgens. So these are um, sex hormones that are not produced in the gonads. These ones are produced in the um, uh, in the adrenal cortex, right? So, um, so if you want to think about it this way, the outermost layer helps you regulate electrolytes like salt. Uh, the next layer, zona fasciculata, helps you regulate sugars, uh, and the innermost layer it has to do with regulation of sex. So, salt, sugar, sex is the order in which those layers go for the adrenal cortex. Um, and then the inside of the adrenal gland is your adrenal medulla. Um, that is where we regulate stress hormones. So a lot of times this adrenal medulla is referred to not so much as endocrine tissue, but as neurosecretory tissue. Um, and that means that uh, it's, it's producing um, things like epinephrine and norepinephrine. Um, and you probably remember those words from when we talked about the nervous system because they act as neurotransmitters. Um, in addition to acting as neurotransmitters, they can also act as hormones. Right? So this is a slightly different use of those same chemicals. All right, here's another picture of that adrenal gland so we can see it all together. So, um, so kidney here um, with the adrenal gland sitting on top, and then the adrenal gland here, we can see the cortex divided into its three layers, and then the medulla on the inside acting as neurosecretory tissue. Okay, all right, so we already mentioned these three things again. So, so outermost layer of the cortex, the glomerulosa, produces those mineral corticoids, which like help you uh, process electrolytes, maintain the correct electrolyte balance in your body. Uh, so at, like salts, so salts are electrolytes. Uh, zona fasciculata, the next layer down, is the regulation of glucose metabolism, so glucocorticoids like cortisol. Uh, and then zona reticularis is gonadocorticoids like uh, sex hormones that are released from, from that uh, innermost layer of the adrenal cortex. All right, and then adrenal medulla uh, produces epinephrine and norepinephrine, um, which are gonna be part of your stress response. So um, as your body experiences stress and your um, sympathetic nervous system begins to take over, um, one of the results of that um, increased sympathetic tone um, is going to be uh, stimulation of adrenal medulla to release epinephrine and norepinephrine uh, into the bloodstream, right? And that's going to result in overall uh, increased uh, blood glucose levels, right? So we can get more of that sugar into the bloodstream so it can be delivered to muscles. Uh, your heart rate's going to increase. Uh, your bronchioles of your lungs are going to dilate so that you can get more oxygen in. 
um, and we're going to redirect blood flow um, from non-essential things like reproduction to more essential things like, like heart, brain, lungs, and skeletal muscle. All right, so, so here's, um, here's what that, that uh, pathway looks like. Uh, so if, we, uh, uh, if we're looking over here, adrenal medulla secretory cell. So we're in the adrenal medulla. That, that secretory cell in the medulla is going to be um, released. Uh, it will be triggered to release epinephrine and norepinephrine from the sympathetic nervous system. So we have sympathetic um, fibers that lead to those cells in the adrenal medulla. And once they receive the signal um, that it's time to be stressed out now, um, that'll trigger um, those uh, secretory cells in the adrenal medulla to release epinephrine and norepinephrine into the bloodstream. So remember that hormones, because we're releasing these into the bloodstream, they're acting like hormones now, which is going to be different from how epinephrine and norepinephrine behaved um, when they were in the uh, in the nervous system, right? In the nervous system, they act as neurotransmitters, which means that they're they're taking a signal across a synapse. In the bloodstream, though, they can have much wider effects on lots of different cells all throughout the body. Okay, so some issues that can happen um, with your glucocorticoid levels. Um, so if you have higher than normal levels of circulating cortisol, um, this can happen for a few reasons. Um, could be um, tumors, there could be um, uh, a condition called Cushing's syndrome, or this can even just be the result of taking um, corticosteroids for too long. So high doses of prednisone for a prolonged period of time can increase uh, cortisol levels of, in the blood. Um, this looks like um, you see higher than normal blood sugar levels, so hyperglycemia. Wound healing tends to be poor. Um, we can get uh, some dermatitis fat redistribution. So, um, so a lot of times you'll see a lot more abdominal fat storage in these patients, um, whereas the arms and the legs, the limbs uh, are having less fat storage. So they look a little bit thinner. Um, and also sometimes you see this buffalo hump at the back of the neck. So kind of like a, a lump of uh, fatty tissue at the back of the neck. All right, so opposite of Cushing's would be um, Addison's disease. So Addison's disease is when you have low levels of circulating corticosteroids. So you're going to see kind of opposite effects here. So low blood glucose levels, um, low sodium, weakness, uh, fatigue, nausea. Um, and there's a picture of JFK here because he was discovered to have Addison's disease. OK, so how does your body respond to stress? Um, well, so this has to do with your adrenal medulla because, um, because these are important stress hormones, right? So your first stage of response to stress, so something scary and stressful happens, a few things are going to happen. We're going to um, initiate an increase in sympathetic tone, right? So your sympathetic nervous system is going to start, start ramping up um, and get, giving you all of those things that you associate with, with high sympathetic tone. So increased um, breathing rate, increased um, heart rate, uh, you've got more blood flowing to the muscles, less blood being devoted to digestion, uh, and that sort of thing. So that's your first stage of that, and that's called alarm. Um, so, and you, it's also going to trigger the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine from the adrenal medulla. Um, if that stressor continues to go on um, for longer than, say, you know, a few a few moments. So if I'm uh, if I'm driving around in the car and I, you know, I have a narrow miss accident, you might have that alarm where you're kind of freaked out for a moment, but then you're, you realize you're no longer in danger. If the stress continues, then you can move into a stage called resistance, right? So you're still stressed out. Uh, it's not going away as fast as you, you would have hoped. Eventually, you can progress to stage three of your, your stress response, which is exhaustion. Um, and this is when that stressor just goes on and on and on and on, which unfortunately is pretty common um, in our modern day lives. So um, historically, stressors would have been fleeting, like, OK, there's a lion over there. Let's run away from it. And now we're safe again so we can relax. Now we tend to be stressed out by things that are um, maybe a little bit less immediate. So, you know, I've got an anatomy test coming up in, in a couple of weeks. I'm really stressed about that. Um, and that stress is long term, doesn't go away. So that can lead to Things like fatigue, um, uh, weakened immune system, uh, depression, uh, and even 
possible sudden um, tragic things like, like a heart attack can result from this prolonged uh, exposure to stress. Okay, so let's move on to our next endocrine gland, um, which is the pancreas. So pancreas is kind of a, a dual function gland, all right? So it's not, it's not only um, an endocrine gland, it actually also functions as an exocrine gland. Uh, and if we can uh, refresh our memories back to AMP1 where we talked about exocrine glands, exocrine glands are glands that secrete their products into ducts that go directly to their final destination. So instead of secreting a hormone that goes into the bloodstream uh, as a normal endocrine function, exocrine function goes directly into a duct to wherever it's going. So for example, your sweat glands are all exocrine glands where they produce sweat that goes into a duct and that duct takes them to a pore and then the sweat is now on the outside of the body. Um, pancreas has both exocrine and endocrine function. Uh, the endocrine function um, is, is composed of what we refer to as the pancreatic islets or the islets of longer hands. Um, and so these are the tiny um, cell clusters within the pancreas that actually have endocrine function. All right, so here's a look at your pancreas. Um, so here we can see um, the, the pancreas is kind of this L-shaped organ. Um, it has a, a large duct in it, and that's for the, the secretion of the exocrine products, which are digestive juices, which we'll talk about in a few weeks. Um, but we do have these pancreatic islets here, which are uh, clusters of cells that are going to be producing the actual pancreatic hormones. And so let's talk about those different hormones. All right, so, so major hormones that you're, you might be familiar with that your pancreas produces are insulin and glucagon. So we're going to talk about what those do. Um, in the pancreatic islets, you have alpha cells. Alpha cells secrete the hormone glucagon. Uh, the job of glucagon is to raise your blood sugar. So um, if your blood sugar is running low, say, for example, it's been a few hours since your last meal, um, you're, you're, you're running out of uh, food energy from your last meal, um, your pancreas will notice that blood sugar levels are low and they will secrete the hormone glucagon. Glucagon will then um, go through the bloodstream and find its way to the liver. When it gets to the liver, it will tell the liver to break down glycogen. Glycogen, remember, is your body's um, starch, your body's version of starch, so it's a carbohydrate storage. Uh, when your liver receives the glucagon to break down glycogen, that glycogen gets converted into glucose, which then enters the bloodstream and raises your blood glucose levels. All right, so that's what glucagon does. Uh, insulin does the opposite. So insulin is released by beta cells of the pancreas. Uh, so, and this happens when your blood sugar levels are high. So if you've just had a meal, um, you've got a lot of sugar entering your bloodstream, uh, your pancreas's beta cells will secrete insulin the insulin will then travel all over the body, and the job of insulin um, is to act as sort of a um, uh, like a key to let blood sugar go from the blood into your body's cells, right? Because your cells need that sugar in order to make ATP energy, but the sugar cannot get into the cells without insulin. So insulin is basically the key that that body cells use to let sugar inside. So when blood sugar levels are high, we want to lower those blood sugar levels by getting the blood into the cells, uh, and they get into the cells with, with the, the help of insulin. Right, so those are the major two hormones uh, that your pancreas makes. Um, your pancreas also has delta cells that make somatostatin, um, and so somatostatin is kind of like a, a, a hormone that will stop insulin and glucagon. So just kind of slow down the other two hormones. So it's a way of regulating those other two. Um, and then um, the unfortunately named PP cells, uh, PP cells or F cells secrete uh, a hormone called pancreatic polypeptide, which has to do with um, influencing your appetite. Right, so there are those four hormones again. So again, glucagon uh, works by raising blood glucose levels by stimulating uh, the liver to break down glycogen um, and so that that glycogen gets converted to glucose and gets released into the bloodstream. Insulin uh, lowers blood glucose by moving glucose from the blood into the cells so the cells can uh, let those mitochondria use it to make ATP 
uh, pancreatic polypeptide influences appetite and digestion, and then somatostatin regulates the other hormones. Okay, so here's a here's a feedback loop for uh, for blood sugar. Right, so um, so as your your pancreas uh, releases insulin, um, insulin will by those beta cells. The beta cells release insulin into the bloodstream. Um, that's going to trigger all of your body cells to open up their, their little glucose doorways, let glucose into the cells, um, into the mitochondria, so the mitochondria can turn that glucose into ATP. Um, so as, as we're using up that, that blood glucose um, and we're turning it into ATP in the cell, then blood glucose concentration goes down, right? So, and, and that's fine, that's a normal result of, of having um, eaten a meal and then using that sugar um, uh, to make energy. Um, if the blood, if the blood glucose, so there's our homeostasis level, if the blood glucose then goes too low at that point, then that's going to trigger the alpha cells of the pancreas here to release glucagon. Glucagon is going to tell the liver um, to, to break down glycogen, uh, and then that glycogen goes, uh, will get, be converted to glucose, go back into the bloodstream, uh, and it's going to bring our blood sugar level back up to homeostasis. So that's that side of the feedback loop. Um, and then we talked about the first side. So if blood sugar is too high, then we make insulin. Uh, the insulin will, will tell the cells to let the blood sugar in the door. Uh, the blood sugar goes into the cells to be converted to energy, and then our blood sugar levels go back down to normal homeostasis levels. All right, so negative feedback loop in both directions. Okay, um, so uh, we should mention that the major issue associated with, uh, with disorder or the major disorder associated with your pancreatic islets is diabetes mellitus. So diabetes mellitus is, is um, you know, an endocrine disorder where you're not producing enough insulin. Um, so, so probably a lot of you are familiar with diabetes. It's very common. Um, it basically, if you're not producing enough insulin, then your blood glucose levels are going to be uh, chronically high. Um, so you have hyperglycemia. Uh, because you have all of this extra glucose in the blood that cannot get into the cells, right? So essentially, diabetes is a wasting disease. Um, it's your cells are starving. They want that sugar, but the sugar cannot get into the cells um, because there isn't enough insulin uh, as a, like a, a, um, a key to unlock the door to get the sugar into the cells. Um, and so because all this extra sugar is hanging out into the bloodstream, um, Eventually, you can have the point where there's so much sugar in the bloodstream um, that some of it spills over into the urine. Um, and so your body has to get rid of it somehow. If it can't go into the cells, it goes out in the urine. Um, and we refer to that uh, presence of sugar in the urine as glucosuria um, when you have sugar in the urine, because normally there should not be any sugar in the urine. Um, symptoms associated with diabetes are the, the three polys, we call them, so polyuria, um, which means excessive urination, polydipsia, which means excessive thirst, and polyphagia, which means excessive hunger, because essentially your cells are very hungry. They're just not getting the food. Even though it's in the bloodstream, it's not getting into the tissues, right? So there are a lot of things that can trigger uh, the onset of diabetes. There are genetic factors, but definitely environmental factors as well. All right, moving down to the testes. Um, so um, testes are, are paired organs uh, for the male reproductive system in, in the, uh, they're held in the scrotum. Um, the the uh, endocrine function of testes is to produce testosterone. So there are cells in there called interstitial cells. Their whole job is to produce testosterone and testosterone has a few different jobs uh, in the body. And one is just to, to um, responsible for uh, the development of male secondary sexual characteristics and uh, for the development of sperm. Um, for females, um, the, uh, the analogous organs are the ovaries. So the, the ovaries' uh, job is, is to produce uh, female sex hormones, which are estrogens and uh, progesterone. Um, so estrogens help promote the development of female secondary sexual characteristics um, progesterone is going to be an important one for maintaining the lining of the uterus um, to promote a healthy pregnancy. 
Um, and again, these hormones, whether estrogens or progesterone or testosterone in the males, these are all regulated by a follicle stimulating hormone uh, and luteinizing hormone um, that come from the anterior pituitary. Okay, uh, another endocrine organ here that's only here sometimes is the placenta. So placenta is a temporary um, organ that occurs during uh, pregnancy um, to help support the fetus, um, but it, it is considered endocrine because it produces a hormone called human chorionic gonadotropin, or HCG. So HCG is that hormone that, that lets you test positive on a, on a pregnancy test. Um, so HCG production uh, tells um, it basically tells the uterine lining to stay put, right? So that we're not shedding uterine lining during pregnancy. We continue to de uh, develop um, a nourishing uterine environment for the fetus. Okay, so we've talked about most of the major endocrine organs now. Um, there are other um, hormones that are produced in your body um, and we'll talk about a few of them as we move through the rest of the course. Um, things like um, your GI tract has a lot of associated hormones with it. So things like gastrin and secretin, cholecystokinin and ghrelin. These are things that are going to be important for the digestive system. And we'll, we'll talk about those a little bit in more detail when we get into digestion. Um, but they basically promote the secretion of digestive juices, um, trigger hunger, um, help you release bile and things like that associated with digestion. Okay, um, your heart surprisingly also has some endocrine function. Um, so specifically the atria um, of your heart are able to produce uh, a hormone called atrial natriuretic hormone or atrial natriuretic peptide, depending on how you want to refer to it. Um, so this is a hormone that gets released by um, the, the atrium of your heart uh, when it's being stretched too much. So this is one of the ways that your heart can regulate um, its own blood pressure, essentially. So if the atria are stretching too much because, um, because blood pressure is too high, um, then they will release atrial natriuretic hormone. Atrial natriuretic hormone uh, goes to the kidneys and tells you to basically pee out more salt, to urinate, to lose more salt in the urine. Um, and as you lose more salt in the urine, you lose overall um, body fluid, and then that's going to eventually result in lower blood pressure. So it's a way of regulating blood pressure uh, by the heart itself. All right, so a few questions here to wrap up. Um, what type of glands secrete their products into ducts? Um, what type of glands secrete their products into the bloodstream? Uh, what type of hormone, water or lipid hormone, uh, create, requires a carrier protein? And what type of hormone requires a second messenger? So think about those ones for a second. All right, and here's your answers. All right, so the type of hormone that secretes directly into a duct is an exocrine gland. All right, so exocrine glands, that's, I shouldn't have said hormone, though. Exocrine glands secrete their products directly into ducts, and they go to, to wherever their destination is. They never enter the bloodstream. Um, endocrine glands, on the other hand, secrete hormones directly into the bloodstream. All right, so totally different type of glands. Uh, what type of hormone requires a carrier protein? Those would be steroid hormones. So steroid hormones are lipid soluble, which means they don't travel in water-based blood that well. They need to be carried uh, by a carrier protein. And then the hormone that requires second messenger would be non-steroid hormones. So the non-steroid hormones are not able to enter the cells because they're not lipid-based. They can't cross that phospholipid bilayer. Um, so they have to use a second messenger to carry their message to the inside of the cell. All right, so I hope that was helpful. Let me know if you have any questions about the endocrine system.